Holly, you're watching Enemy, and today I'm joined by Mark Ronson. Hey Mark, how are you doing? Good, thank you. Thanks. Amazing. So we're here to speak to you today, first and foremost, about the launch of your new BBC Maestro production course. Uh, what can you tell us about what people can expect from it? Um, I mean, it's pretty like nuts and bolts comprehensive. I mean, I think the worst thing is when you buy those maestro or the master classes and it's just like somebody telling anecdotes about their biggest records and you're just like, you don't buy that stuff. Like, oh, that's great too. I'm sure some legends have great stories, but I actually, you know, I wanted to give like a fully comprehensive nuts and bolts thing about like I guess everything I've learned in my 25 years or whatever it is of making records and you know some of the stuff that's really important is pretty micro and it can be how to chop a drum break or how to record a singer or a drum kit and then some of it is a little bit more macro about you know relationships in in the studio and fostering that feeling of trust and how to you know record a, a vocal with a singer but but just to get like that whole spectrum of it and to cover everything from the you know the ableton pro tools logic you know laptop side of things all the way to recording a band and you know when i started i was i i learned stuff and from other people watching other people being around the studio and um, I was lucky enough to be around some great people from the Dap Kings to Questlove to whoever, and I saw how they mic their drum kits and what they were doing. And But not everybody has that opportunity. And in the beginning, I guess I was more possessive of that. And was like, you know, someone asked me how to, how I got a certain sound, I'd be like, you know, screw you, go get your own sound. And now it's like, maybe it's just like softening an old age or something, but I'm excited about the idea of, passing that stuff on and um and it, yeah that's just it i really tried to get everything in it you know i i i we did the first round of filming and then i showed it to some young producers that i know who have either worked in my studio or engineers who i've worked with and and i was like and then they gave me feedback when like well you miss this and the sound from this and like you know it's great to give the beginners lessons, but we also want like, if we already have been producing for five or six years, we want really want to know like what's in the trick bag. So we went back and we filmed a lot more because, you know, I might, I'm unlikely to ever do this again. So I wanted to make sure that it was comprehensive. Yeah. I mean, what's it like kind of opening up that process for the first time? Are you, are you less protective over it now? Is it a little bit scary to let people in on that? I think it was good. You know, at first I was a bit, nervous because you know one thing that we really did was we showed a session and a song being created from scratch and we did it with this you know this incredible artist john bellion who's an amazing singer and songwriter but you never know like the cameras are up watching it's hard enough with zero cameras like on a given day when you've got a new person that you're collaborating with that, that you're gonna get anything that either of you guys like and then you throw eight cameras up and you know you get everyone gets red light fever but i really wanted to show other than go into songs that i've done before and take the hood off which is helpful i wanted to get the creative process from scratch so that was definitely nerve-wracking and i was like well, what if all these people here from the bbc they flew over from england to my studio in new york like what if this sucks and we can't use it i can't if we make a bad song i'm not going to put it on uh on, on in this program but like like all good things it was like a challenge at times and, and then um eli the the director he had a really good idea of, and he was great at coaxing things out and and let me um instead of doing the kind of thing you would expect like the cameras are all in the control room one day and then they're in the live room next day. I was like, we need them in both rooms because you just don't know when you're going to get an idea and then want to run and do a drum thing and then come in. So they were really flexible. And I think we captured a lot of my process in a way that like would make it more genuine and real if you were watching this. Mm. And if people pre-order the course now, they get instant access to your breakdown of uh, Amy Winehouse's Back to Black. What's kind of your memories of, of the production process on that track with her? I mean, it was so fast in some ways because, um, you know, Amy and I, the six songs that we did on Back to Black together, we kind of 
did in five to seven days. Like I always think like, damn, I wish it did take longer because I would have more memories and what we would have been in the studio. Not that we didn't spend plenty of time hanging out after that, but we, it was just so quick. But Back to Black was, that was the first song that we wrote when we met and because she had written a lot of the songs already. Um, and, you know, I just helped produce and arrange them. But she she came in and, she, you know, she told me what she wanted her record to sound like. And I think she'd been working on the record for a while because it had been three or four years since Frank. And I remember even when I was going in with the studio, even though I wasn't a big producer at that time, I was just happy to have like any gig. I remember people being like, oh, you're working with Amy Winehouse? Like, good luck with that. Like, I heard she's been working on that album forever. And I just met this person who was so like incredibly together and lucid. I was like, I don't know who they're talking about, but I just met this incredibly smart girl who's just come in and told me like what she wants her record to sound like. And she's playing me five demos on the guitar, which blew me away. So I was just very excited and I really liked it. We like instantly kind of hit it off when we're joking. And so that night when she went home, I wasn't panicked, but I was definitely like, I gotta come up with something that she's gonna dig because she was leaving to go back to London the next day. So I stayed up all night, tinkered around with some ideas and I had the idea for the piano chords and uh, uh, to back to back. And I did a very rough demo and she came in the next day and played the piano. I played the demo for her and she instantly liked it. And she went in the back room and in an hour and a half scribbled all the lyrics down and came and sang it to me. And I was like, wow. I do remember one thing that I said that I feel really stupid about, but it's, you know, I wouldn't be honest about the process if you also didn't say about the dumb mistakes you make when you're making a record or, or a lot of it is when the artist is right and when to know or when to just let them do their thing. But she said, we only said goodbye in words. I died a thousand times. And I was like, well, that doesn't rhyme. Like it doesn't, cause like in my little ex novice experience of that moment, I was like, you know, producer 101, the words rhyme in the chorus, they have to, or like, it won't be a hit. And she just looked at me like, this is what I wrote. Like, I'm not changing this. This is my, this is what like burst out of me. So it was great. And, you know, most of the time we really were kind of like had the same ideas about stuff, but that's what I remember about that song. Mm -hmm. And you recently released the raw demo of her vocals, which obviously meant a lot to a lot of people to be able to hear that. How did you come across that? And how did it feel listening to that for the first time again? I just forgot that I had it, honestly. Like I was, uh, I was making a video. I was making a TikTok. Oh, it just sounds so crazy to say that because I'm so late on TikTok. But basically I was making a TikTok and I, I was just talking about that song and I went back to open the demo and I was like, oh my God, this is just like different lyrics, different melodies. Um, and it was just cool. And I just thought, you know, in today's world, like, I mean, hopefully if it ever, they want to put out a box set, you know, give it to them or whatever it is. But it just felt like such a cool instant way to like share it with her fans. And I guess, you know, it was, it was nice to do that. And I'm mm. glad I remember that I had it. Mm. Are there any other demos that you stumbled across that you might release? I guess I have all of them, but I mean, not, most of them aren't very different from, but um, yeah, but Wake Up Alone, You Know I'm No Good, Back to Black, Rehab, all those early demos are, are, are different in some ways, you know? Mm. And incredibly, we're coming up to the 15 year anniversary of the release of Valerie in October. What does that song mean to you when you look back at it kind of in the bigger picture of your career and maybe what turning point it was? Yeah, it's really crazy because, you know, Amy and I had finished Back to Black and she had come out to New York and she had never met the musicians from Adapting who had played on their album because we did all the demos and she had to go back to England and I think because when her grandmother was sick and I did all the recording with the band. So she's already seen the CD booklet and I remember she looked at her credits when it finally came and she called me and she was so excited. I was like in the airport in the newsstand and she goes, so you mean to tell me there's someone named Binky Griptide that played guitar on my album? I'm like, yeah, it's Binky, he's the best. Like, so it was this moment where she came to New York and met all these people that they had already done this pretty wonderful thing together, then never met each other. So we're in the studio and I was making version, finishing it up and it was all covers, you know, and I just said, Amy, is there like a song? We got to do a song. You've been I'm back to black. This is this thing I want you on my record. Is there any song that you like? 
and I was trying to f stay in this vein of doing kind of like more modern and indie-ish songs. And she said, well, I like this song by the Zootones. They play at my local called Valerie. And I hadn't heard it and I listened to it and it was like, you know, the first time, and I've told Dave McCabe this, I mean, Dave is a brilliant songwriter, but I was like, I didn't really get it at first. It wasn't the kind of music I listened to. It was kind of like, da -na 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 -na. it was this stonesy, messy stump. And then Amy, Amy, I was just like, okay, cool. And then that was like the genius of Amy, like an artist like that who knows their own sound and what their voice will sound like singing a song so well that, you know, we just wrote out the chart quickly and the band learned it and we did it. And then we did like a slow version that's on Lioness Hidden Treasures. And then as everybody was packing up, I just had this like idea and I was like, guys, 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 like literally the guitars were in the cases being shut. And I was like, can we just do like a really dumb one that just goes like, do, 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 like just something stupid. I know you guys hate me. I know you like to play the soul shit, make it complicated and cool. Not complicated, but so far. I was like, I know this seems a little obvious. And then that was it. And we played it and, and you know, the other one was probably a little more deeper and Thingy, it might even be the one that Amy liked more, but the you know the one that we ended up doing was also great because it had this dancey beat that everybody really responded to. Amazing. And in terms of people you've been working with more recently, so you collaborated with Lizzo on her upcoming album, which is out next month. What was the experience of working in the studio with her like? Um, I loved it. I mean, it was my first thing back after the pandemic, so like I hadn't been in the studio with anyone in a while. I nearly canceled it eight times because I was like, what? I haven't been around anyone. What if I like, I don't have any good ideas, like the pressure, she's like such a big artist, the expectations, it's not like going in with a, you know, a new a new person. We just had so much fun and we made, we made a bunch of great music. One of them is Break Up Twice is on the record and it's, I genuinely really love it. It's one of my favorite things I think I've, ever done and uh hopefully some of the other music will see the light of day at some time but um she's just fantastic she's the real deal like I, I don't think i even really knew how musical she was until we till we got in together just like harmonies stacking vocals her songwriting i mean we know she's a great lyricist and, and singer and can play the flute but it's just like a whole load of other like arrangement and things in her brain that i was just so impressed by mm. And how about solo material from you? Obviously, we had Late Night Feelings in 2019. Have you been working on anything yourself? Any new album on the horizon? I have. Um, I've been working, well, I've been working a bit, uh, King Princess on her new record, you know, to obviously she produces and writes everything herself, but there's one or two songs on there, including uh, my favorite song she's ever written, which, uh, has Taylor Hawkins playing drums on it. And it's just like one of the most fucking incredible like drum performances I've ever recorded. So that I'm really excited for. And then my own record. Yeah, I've been writing a book as well about 90s club life in New York City, like which is when I sort of started DJing. It was a, you know, very exciting, colorful time. So I, I'm also working on a, on a record that they, it's not like they're like go together, but the record has some 90s covers and some other things and they both like celebrate a similar time. So uh, hopefully next year those will both be coming. Mm -hmm. And of course you mentioned Taylor Hawkins there and you've just been added to the lineup for his tribute concert uh, later this year. Um, do you have any memories of working with him personally? I know you described him as the greatest rock drummer of our time and one of a kind. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, this this KP, this King Princess song that he played on was the first thing that we recorded together, um, and it was just awesome. And he was, we had we had been texting, you know, a week before um, the tragedy happened about working. I, you know, there was so much I loved. He was such a versatile drummer too. What wasn't, wasn't just like like a Gonzo rock dude. He could had amazing feels, like soulful. And um, yeah, we had just done this together and I, I really just felt like it was like, just, we we're just about to do a lot more. And, and you know, I know he meant a lot to a lot of people and I'm sure that was the case with a bunch of people, but um, yeah, it's incredibly sad and but gave 
Grohl asked me to be a part of this thing to celebrate him. And I mean, that's all we had to say. You could have literally just said like, we need some extra roadies on the night. I'd be like, okay, whatever you need. Well, thank you so, so much for your time today. It's been a real pleasure to talk to you. Thanks. And uh, best of luck with the launch of the, of the BBC Maestro course. Thank you so much.